Alright, today is Monday, May 16th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and I know a lot of you are having a bad day for whatever reason, but be thankful because it could get a lot worse. What do you mean by that, Maverick? Here it is. CNN, remember the implosion of CNN Plus? Well, here it is. CNN accidentally sent welcome baskets to employees who had been laid off after the CNN Plus streaming service flopped. And to add insult to injury, CNN asked for the baskets back. The good news is CNN allowed the ex-employees to keep the bagels, which uh, CNN stole from the Holiday Inn anyways. And it gets even worse. Rumor has it the ex-employees ate the bagels and now they have food poisoning. So yes, it could get a lot worse. So stop bitching and whining, and here it is, in focus tonight. Bezos versus Biden. What's going on here? And then we have Elon Musk versus Twitter. Ay, ay, ay. And lastly, the hedgies are getting whacked in the stock market, and perhaps we have more pain to come. We start with the story of uh, Bezos versus Biden. And let's back up here for a moment, because when I first came to this country, I was taught that we have, in this country, in the United States, we have two political parties, Democrats and Republicans, which was shocking to me because a country this big and you only have two parties. Anyways, but I was taught that the Democrats, the donkeys, are the ones pro the little guy, they're pro-union, and they're standing up against the big corporations and big pharma, they're anti-war, they're pro the American dream, yada yada yada. And the Republicans are the ones who are pro big corporations, pro big pharma, pro Goldman Sachs, pro war, pro corruption, pro prejudice, etc etc. In other words, the Democrats are the good guys, the Republicans are the bad guys. Although, a wise old lady once told me, and I didn't understand that back then because I was a teenager, but she told me the Republicans are wolves. The Democrats, well, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Anyhow, we're seeing a massive change in American politics right now. A seismic shift, the likes that we have never seen since the LBJ presidency. The Democrat Party has evolved. Uh, not to the better, of course, but to the worse. They're now a weird combination between the extreme woke kind of crowd and the Bush-era neocons, the pro-war, pro-corruption, pro-corporation kind of crowd. The likes of uh, Bolton, Colin Powell, and Dick Cheney, they're all Democrats now. And of course, this weird combination between extreme wokeness and the warmongers, deep staters, neocons, is causing the Democratic Party to be out of touch from the American public. And this is being reflected in polls. The polls are disastrous. Even NBC's Chuck Todd says that the Democrats are in some serious trouble in the midterms. And this is the part of the story where this man, Kristen Smalls, enters the chat. Kristen Smalls was an Amazon warehouse employee, and during the pandemic shutdowns, he was asking for safety and health conditions to be enforced in Amazon's warehouses. And of course, he got fired by Amazon for speaking up, but the man was not deterred at all. He decided to fight back. And this is as American as a story can get, because you get fired by the evil empire of Amazon, but you decide to fight back and you beat the evil empire. And indeed, Kristen Smalls defeated the evil empire of Amazon by unionizing one of the largest warehouses in the country in Staten Island. And we made a video about that oh, about a month ago. Now, the seismic shift in American politics is not just happening in the Democratic Party. It's also happening in the Republican Party. What do I mean by that? Well, you got your old school neocons, cut taxes for the corporations, and everything will be fine. The uh, military industrial complex kind of crowd, the deep state kind of crowd, the McCain's, the McConnell's, the Lindsey Graham's of the world. For example, here's an exchange between Lindsey, Lindsey Graham, and Kristen Smalls, and Kristen Smalls absolutely decimated Lindsey. Take a listen. The idea that you can only get a government contract if you promise to be neutral is ridiculous. Boeing is in South Carolina making the 787. There's been efforts to unionize Boeing. They lose. The people in that plant will make that decision. The idea that Boeing can't argue the merits of a right to work environment for their business is ridiculous. And I think patently illegal. This is a heavy handed approach the most radical agenda in my lifetime. 
and it should be carried out at the ballot box, and it will be. If we take this body back, this demonization of individual companies that are subject to the law will cease. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to address Mr. Graham. Um, first of all, you know, you're, it sounded like you was talking about more of the companies and the businesses in your speech, but you forgot that the people are the ones who make this, these companies operate. And if we're not protected, and if the process for when we hold these companies accountable is not working for us, then that's not what, that's the reason why we're here today. That's the reason why I'm here to represent the workers who make these companies go. And I think that it's in your best interest to realize that it's not a, a left or right thing. It's not a Democrat or a Republican thing. It's a workers thing. It's a workers issue. And we're the ones that are suffering in the corporations that you're talking about, in the businesses that you're talking about, in the warehouses that you're talking about. So that's the reason why I think I was invited today to speak on that behalf. And you should listen because we do represent your constituents as well. Um, so just take that into consideration that the people are the ones that make these corporations go. It's not the, it's not the other way around. And then you have the new wing of the Republican Party, the Trump America first wing of the party who appear to be more concentrated and focused on domestic policies. And they appear to be anti-war and perhaps pro union. I mean, you'd think that Amazon would be open to a union when you it's a very progressive company. Why do you think they're trying to thwart you from organizing? Amazon hasn't been unionized in this country since the beginning of its uh, existence. And they're very anti-union. You know, yeah. they, want, they created a system that hires and fires people. They created a system that they have full control of the working, the working people. And, um, you know, having a union obviously brings representation for the workers that will benefit the workers at the bottom, like myself. Uh, hourly associates, entry-level workers that don't get the, the right to negotiate. So forming a union gives us the right to collect a bargain with the company, form a contract to protect ourselves. So that's exactly what we're trying to do with the Amazon Labor Union. Um, we're hoping that we'll be a catalyst for something that'll take place nationwide. Well, I, I certainly am rooting for you. I mean, maybe if they throw some more woke slogans at you, you'll forget you can't feed your family. <laughs> Right. Chris, I appreciate your coming on. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And of course, that was a cute trick by Tucker to make Kristen Small slips and become a political figure. But so far, Smalls has been laser focused on the issues and he refused to make this political at all. And good for him. It was the reason why he became successful in the fight against Amazon. But did you hear the part where Tucker Carlson says, I'm rooting for you? Are you saying the ultra-conservative right-winger is pro-unions now, pro-labor, and the Democrats and Joe Biden isn't? What's going on here in America? What's going on in the state of our politics? We're seeing a massive shift and divide, a seismic shift, the likes that we've never seen before. Like I said, since the LBJ era, all these divisions will be sorted out in time, and the Democratic Party will emerge with one victorious wing, and so will the Republican Party, and that leaves... A huge chunk of the Democrats and the Republicans with no home at all. So will we see the formation of the third party, for example? A lot of interesting things are happening in American politics right now. But here's the take. The Biden administration has been cozy with Amazon and Jeff Bezos. I mean, if you're going to let the guy French kiss your wife, all bets are off. But Joe Biden realized that being anti-union, anti-labor in this inflationary environment where labor is struggling to cope with the cost of living and being pro the oligarchy of Amazon and these massive businesses is costing him at the polls. The numbers for Joe Biden are disastrous among Gen Zers, millennials, young black males, young Latinos. We're seeing the lowest poll numbers that we have ever seen in that regard when it comes to Biden and the Democrats. So Joe Biden decided to invite Christian Smalls in the White House and congratulate him for winning the union vote in Staten Island. And way to go, Christian Smalls, uh, best of luck. All of a sudden, Biden wants to appear as pro-union and pro-the little guy. And of course, that pissed Dr. Evil Jeff Bezos. In a tweet, Joe Biden suggested that to tackle inflation, we should tax the rich. 
And of course, Dr. Evil, one of the richest men in America, came out and said that the disinformation board should investigate Biden's tweet. You know, this is the new Ministry of Propaganda, the Ministry of Truth, that Joe Biden's utilized to suppress the voices of Americans. Well, Bezos took a jab using the Ministry of Truth. And he said the newly created disinformation board should review this tweet, or maybe they need to form a new non sequitur board instead. Raising corporation taxes is fine to discuss. Taming inflation is critical to discuss. Mushing them together is just misdirection. And of course, Jeff Bezos has been a freeloader his whole life. He did not pay taxes for years. So why would he like paying taxes now? And of course, the White House fired back and said it doesn't require a huge leap to understand why Bezos opposed an economic agenda that taxes the super rich. And while the fight in the ring between Biden and Bezos was getting hot, here comes Larry Summers, entering the ring and saying that Jeff Bezos is mostly wrong, and we should raise taxes to reduce demand to contain inflation. Now, is raising taxes on corporations reduces inflation? The answer is yes, it does. Joe Biden is right in this regard. Why? Because when you increase corporate taxes, you reduce capital expenditure, which means that corporations have to cut jobs, they have to reduce spending, and that reduces inflation as a result. Now, is it the best approach? Of course not, because you're going to cause job losses, you're going to cause less investment in the economy. But that is beside the point. The point I want to make here in this segment is, do we have any small business owners watching right now? Please let me know in the comments. Because if you have a small business, a store that sells, let's say, a variety of merchandise, let me ask you a question. Can you lose money year after year and still stay in business? Can you lose money year after year and still secure loans to expand and open more stores? Can you reduce your prices to undercut the competition and lose money and still be in business after all? The answer to all of that is no chance. Not at all. If you're a small business owner, you gotta produce profits every single year. Otherwise, you're out of business. You cannot secure loans if you're not profitable. It is extremely hard to secure loans to expand your business. Now, let's flip this coin to the large business, Amazon. Can Amazon lose money year over year by undercutting the competition in small businesses, by lowering their prices and taking loans, billions of dollars worth of loans to expand and create a massive logistics operation to completely destroy any competition? small businesses? The answer is yes, you can. So we're playing with two rules here in this country. One for small businesses, mom and pops, and the other for the big, large corporations like Amazon. You see, when the Federal Reserve decided to start QE, quantitative easing, which is another code word for accommodations to the rich, because the end result of QE is propping up the stock and real estate markets. But most importantly, the most important part of QE is the Fed acts as a traffic cop because the most important part of QE is to buy bonds. The Fed buys bonds. And therefore, by buying bonds and crushing the yields on bonds, they create a risk on environment and equities because are you going to buy bonds? when the Fed is crushing the yield? Or can you get yield and returns bigger ones, larger ones, elsewhere in the stock market? Under quantitative easing, growth becomes appreciated, meaning stock market investors appreciate the growth in revenues and they don't care about the growth in net income, the bottom line, profits. We can go in another video and explain why in details, but this is all what you need to know for now. The end result of all of that is money flows into growth stocks like Amazon, regardless whether the company is profitable or not, so long as they continue to grow year over year. And then Amazon, even though they're losing money year over year because they're reducing prices to undercut the competition to destroy mom and pop small businesses and pave the way for a monopoly, the stock price of Amazon is high. It's worth billions and billions and billions of dollars and now trillions. So what do they do? They take loans and it's so easy for them to take loans by hedging their equity price the stock price, and expand even more. And at some point, the company becomes profitable, like we're seeing right now in Amazon. But after years of this practice, what is the end result in America, in the status of business in America? Small businesses, mom and pops, are gone, they're destroyed completely. On the other hand, we're seeing more and more concentration of commerce between the giants, Amazon, Walmart, Target, etc. So when you say that 
The rise of Amazon was due to Jeff Bezos being smart. You have no idea what are you talking about. Smart has nothing to do with it. This is a broken system. And these oligarchs took advantage of the broken system. The rigged economy that we have right now. That we've been having since QE. And even before that. We have different rules for small businesses, rules that are restrictive, and then we have no rules, an open field for large enterprises to continue to grow and eat away whatever left of small business in America. And that is the real take from the Bezos versus Biden saga. Now let's move on to the Elon Musk versus Twitter saga because it's getting uglier by the day. Now, by now, you're well aware that I'm anti-Elon, I'm a critic of Elon Musk, but I praised him when he said he wants to buy Twitter to protect free speech. But I'm starting to regret my praise for Elon and I'm feeling that I should have trusted my gut that this guy is the con man of the century and he's always going to be that way. So what's going on here? I talked about this before. I said that the deal doesn't make sense at all, financially speaking. Why would Elon pay $44 billion for a garbage company that is barely worth $20 billion? Why doesn't he wait for Twitter stock to crash because all stocks are crashing now that the Fed is ending QE and moving to quantitative tightening, QT, where we appreciate profit growth not revenue growth. So Twitter is trash. It's not worth $44 billion at all. Why would Elon even suggest that this will be his final offer, making all of that fuss about buying Twitter without thinking at all. These technology companies in the Valley are facing massive, massive challenges. We're seeing mass layoffs planned in these software and social media companies. Twitter CEO already got, got rid of two leaders and they're freezing hiring. No more hiring. This is a company in trouble. This is a company on the verge of bankruptcy. Just give it a little bit of time. So Elon could have waited and picked up the scraps. He could have picked up Twitter for pennies in the dollar. But now that he opened his mouth prematurely, the pitchforks came out for Elon. Now the deep state oligarchy is scrutinizing every single move Elon has done in his life. And of course, as a response, the government decided to start the Ministry of Propaganda officially, of course. And they hired this uh, creepy lady, Nina Jankowicz, to be the propaganda minister of the United States. And now she says verified Twitter users should be able to edit others' tweets, specifically those with misinformation. She says people like her should be verified, but a lot of folks who are verified right now should not be verified. Does this sound like North Korea? Because it is. And the backlash against Musk is intensifying. Tesla stock has been crashing since the moment Elon announced buying Twitter. We can put our tinfoil hats on and say that we have certain billionaires who are selling their Tesla shares to punish Elon. It doesn't matter what the reason is. The end result is the same. Elon made a massive mistake because he took the share price of Tesla for granted even though he knows this is a massive bubble and Tesla stock will crash. So hedging Tesla shares to buy Twitter is a massive, massive mistake. It is a huge risk that somebody like Elon should never even think about. If Tesla shares go down further, he's going to be in a world of trouble. Forget about buying Twitter. The guy could lose a massive amount of money and even more dangerous, jeopardize Tesla as a company. So Elon now comes out and says that he's trying to look for a lower price for Twitter. Oh, you think? Why wasn't this thinking happening before Elon opened his mouth? I mean, they say this guy's the smartest guy in the world, yet he makes the most impulsive and dumbest decisions ever. Musk, of course, paused the deal, the $44 billion deal to acquire Twitter. And he says it's due to the bots. Twitter lied about the bots. It appears that Twitter has more bots than they've announced before. And Elon is using that as an excuse to pause the deal. In reality, Elon is pausing the deal because Tesla stock went down a lot. And as Tesla stock continues to go down, it's going to go down big, perhaps to 100 at some point. It's not just that Twitter will be damaged and perhaps go bankrupt, but Tesla could be damaged financially big time because he will get margin call. Now, once Elon pumped the stock of Twitter by announcing that he's going to buy the company. He's, by the way, started buying shares back in January. And now he's dumping. He's saying, I'm pausing the deal. Twitter stocks is down billions of dollars. It wiped out all of the gains since Elon announced the acquisition deal. So for now, it appears that this is yet another pump and dump scheme by Reverend Elon Musk. He bought Twitter. He pumped the stock higher. And who knows if he sold these shares or not? Who knows if some of his clan bought call options in Twitter, for example, and they scored big. This man is surrounded by fraud. Pumps and dumps all over the place. And now even Whitbush, Dane Ivis, he says that Elon Musk is using the dog ate the homework excuse to potentially back out of buying Twitter. 
Twitter. And there is now a chance, a less than 50% chance, that the deal is gonna get done, according to Ivis. Now, this is already a scandal, but it's gonna evolve into a scandal of epic proportions if Elon Musk indeed backs out of the deal. And in all likelihood, Elon is realizing that Twitter is not worth anything near $44 billion. And no billionaires are gonna support him in buying Twitter at $44 billion. Maybe Peter Thiel gave him a little bit of money. Maybe, uh, what's his face from Oracle? Larry Ellison gave him a little bit of money, but he's not gonna find any more support than this. And even these billionaires who already gave him money are gonna say, hey, Elon, the company's not worth $44 billion. It's worth $20 billion at best. What are you doing here? So once Elon backs out of the deal officially, this is gonna be a massive, massive scandal, and the SEC is gonna get him this time around. So watch out here because this could damage Tesla shares specifically big time. And the lesson of the day is, remember the scene from Glengarry Ross, since we're talking about always be closing. Remember the scene where uh, Al Pacino says this to Kevin Spacey? You wanna learn the first rule, you'd know if you ever spent a day in your life. You never open your mouth till you know what the shot is. You child. So yeah, don't open your mouth till you know what the shot is. The smartest people in the room are the quiet ones because they're thinking, not talking. Now let's move on and talk about the market for a little while here because I tweeted this today. After many dips and rebounds this year, one theme is becoming clear. Buying the dip in the beaten down tech stocks has not been rewarding as these stocks tend to rebound big and then fade fast. On the other hand, buying the dip in energy and commodities has been rewarding so far. Some of you on Friday asked me if I'm buying the rebound and which stocks I'm buying and I said just oil and gas repeatedly, only oil and gas because I gotta see more confirmation from the stock market before I buy any rebounds in technology or the beaten down stocks. I mean, you look at the software stocks Today, for example, they're down big again. They rebounded really fast. Thursday, Friday, some gaining 20-30%. And fast forward today, they're down 10% again. So what is the point here? It appears that the sustainability in rebounds is happening in commodities-related stocks. Not technology, at least for now. And the pain in the Nasdaq is becoming clearer by the day. Last week alone, the Nasdaq lost nearly $1 trillion. And this happens to be the longest streak of losses since 2012 for the Nasdaq. The volatility is the highest since 2008 in the Nasdaq. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Head spinning action. And of course, look at this. The volatility for the Nasdaq is reaching the highs from October of 2020. Now, this could be a sign that we're reaching peak volatility, peak fear, and a rebound could be coming in the Nasdaq, but we have to see more confirmations. Folks, I always say, show me the money. Let the charts show you the money show me that this is indeed a bottom and the rebound is legit and then i'm interested in buying the dip but for now the only sector of the stock market that is showing me the money is energy commodities etc because we have folks from data trek for example saying that the nasdaq will see more pain to come we think the 2022 nasdaq is even worse than the 2000 nasdaq because all the sorts of events that unfolded from march 2000 the index lows in october 2002 are happening in one fell swoop now including aggressive fed policy recession worries and oil price spike so we had the mother of all bubbles now we're having the mother of all storms and the pain is becoming evident among the hedges. Yep, the hedge funds, which you people give your money to blindly, were the down big. For example, Tiger Global, which was the best performer among hedge funds last year, and for many years, by the way, because the market was easy, just buy the gross stocks and go back to sleep. Well, now they're becoming the biggest losers. And among the losers is the Maverick Management, which is not related to me, by the way. I wouldn't do such dumb things. I actually shorted Carvana. But look at that. Their loss is 84% in Carvana, 77% of Farfetch, 77% in Revion. And it goes on and on and on. They're losing a massive amount of money. We have more firms now sounding the alarm. Goldman Sachs, 
is calculating the worst case scenario and they're moving the target down. They're now saying we could go down 30% in a recession scenario. Matter of fact, Goldman Sachs is cutting its US GDP forecast again. And rest assured, Goldman Sachs will have to revise this forecast over and over and over again because they continue to believe that the US will have a positive GDP, not even close. And now we're hearing from a famed investor, the big short, who is shorting Apple of all stocks. This is a massive bet against the entirety of the stock market because if Apple goes down, everything will go down. And perhaps Mr. Burry is not crazy. Perhaps he is crazy as a fox because Apple iPhone suppliers are being shut down in China. So the production is going to go down and these draconian shutdowns in China will cost Apple billions of dollars. We did not see the impact in the last report, but the impact will become clear in upcoming reports. And Apple did not price that in as a stock. And therefore, Burry could be onto something here. But in the short run, it could be a sign that you should buy call options in Apple because Mr. Burry is going to eat another pie in the face at least for a little while. His timing is not that good, believe it or not. But for Folks, if you had your hopes high that this is a legitimate rebound or we're going to recover or we're going to have a relief rally, all the horses because uh, JP Morgan, a quant guru, Marko Kapralovic, he says stocks are set to bounce again after pricing too much recession risk. Remember, Kapralovic has been saying buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip since the Santa rally dip. And so far, the Nasdaq is down almost 30%. The Nasdaq would be down 50%, and Marko Goranovic would be saying, by the dip, we're going back to old time highs. At what point do we realize that these people are fraud? They have absolutely no clue what they're talking about. They're as right as any guess, yet they're paid millions of dollars to give their so-called expert opinion. And it was so easy to sound like a genius back when the stock market was going up and up and up because the Fed was pumping a massive bubble in the equities market. All you have to say is, by the dip, and we're going higher. And that made Tom Lee and Marco Kogoranovic and other analysts famous. But this is the kind of market, this bear market, is where the real guys and gals appear. Whether you actually know what you're talking about or you don't. And so far it appears that Kukoranovic doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. But here's the good news, folks. We have to end in a positive note. Remember Bank of America? Bank of America has been bearish so far. They've been right. But even Bank of America is now saying that the massive exodus is a signal for true capitulation, meaning this could be a bottom for now, and we could have a legitimate rebound rally. It is not just the sentiment by Bank of America. Even BlackRock's uh, writer, reader, whatever his name is, says a summer rally is coming in U.S. bonds, but bull market is likely over. Uh, it's not just likely over. It is over, buddy. Get in with the program. And if you are a meme stock investor and you're down big, don't feel bad. You got allies who believe in you. For example, Ray Dalio dumped his Tesla shares last quarter. And what did he buy? Yep, GameStop and AMC. Uh-oh. You see, when Ray Dalio starts investing like a moron, we got a massive problem here. But rest assured, if you feel confused, you're not alone. We're all confused. Why are we confused? Because the Fed is confused. Powell says he wants to tackle inflation, and then he says, but I'm not going to do 75 basis points. I'm going to do half-point hikes in June and July. And then comes the king of doves, New York Fed President Williams, who said the bond market volatility is not problematic at all. Well, there's nothing going on here. What are you guys looking at? Please disperse. And he reiterated that the central bank is moving hard to lower inflation, meaning that even the 50-point basis hikes is too much for Williams. He wants to go back to 25 basis points. And then we have Zombie from Cleveland, Mister, who says, oh, no, 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 no. The 75 basis points are back on the table for September. So which one is it? Is it going to be 50, 75, 25, zero? We have no clue because the Fed has no clue. The Fed is so confused and disorganized and lacks strategy. Clear strategy. Why? We go back to the root of the problem. The Fed remains obsessed with the stock market. They don't want to upset the stock market at any cost. But at the same time, they realize that equities have to go down for financial conditions to tighten. This is the conflict that's going on internally in the Fed. So Jerome Powell does the FOMC conference. The stock market is down big and he says to calm down the stock market, of course, 75 basis points is off the table. Okay, the stock market responds and it blasts significantly higher. The very next day, the stock market goes down big, and the reasoning that they gave us is the stock market is upset that Jerome Powell took the 75 basis points off the table. Now comes Mr. and says, okay, the stock market is upset that we're not doing the 75. We'll do the 75. 
and they're going to continue to chase the stock market moves rather than doing the right thing. What is the strategy by the Fed? They should give a clear strategy. By September, the interest rates are going to be at 3%. Whatever it is, are we going to do 50 basis points from this point on? 75 basis points from this point on? Just give us clarity and the stock market will respond positively believe it or not. Anyhow, we have to move on to cover the stock market information for you, and we start with the performance of indices today, and here we go. It was yet another zigzag day in the equities market today. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 26.76 points, or a gain of 0.08%. The Nasdaq was actually down by 142.21 points, or a decline of 1.20%. The S&P 500 down slightly by 15.88 points, or a decline of 0.39%. The sector's performances led by energy, big time at number one, capturing the gold medal, and at number two for the silver, healthcare, number three for the bronze utilities. The laggards of the day led by cyclicals, technology, and communication services. Here is the advance to decline ratios. NYSE 47% advancing versus 50% declining. The NASDAQ 39% advancing versus 56% declining. Moving on to commodities, Brent was trading higher today, gaining over two and a quarter percent today. And then we have the WTI pretty much flattish. And then gasoline, believe it or not, gasoline was up over 1% today. This is incorrect. And this is the first time we've seen gasoline prices above 4 bucks. Likewise, natural gas closing in the green. When we talk about gasoline prices, we only have three states in the country, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Georgia, where prices at the pumps are less than 4 bucks a gallon. Now, we're going to have some international viewers from the UK, for example, saying, hey, 4 bucks a gallon is nothing. You Americans need to buck up because here in the United Kingdom, we're paying seven bucks a gallon is the problem we have no infrastructure at all we don't have public transportation at all in certain cities we have more gas guzzlers on the road we drive more than europeans so the economic cost of four bucks a gallon here in this country is more devastating than seven bucks a gallon in the uk and of course i know it's leader not gallon over there but you can use google you know the invention that we call google and you can convert the units but anyhow if you're looking for any relief well, it's not coming anytime soon. Now you might say, but Maverick, what about the supply? If we increase the supply of oil, then prices are going to go down. The problem is, it's not a supply issue. It's a cocaine issue. All of those trillions are chasing oil right now. Those trillions that the Fed printed, they don't disappear in a black hole. They're still circulating in the system. That's number one. Number two, the Saudi oil minister came out today and said that increasing the supply is not going to do anything to drop prices down. And the reason is refineries are all backed up. There are no more refineries available. And therefore, what is the point of increasing the supply at this point? I mean, look at refineries' profit margins. Unbelievable. The highest profit margins in history, specifically after the push to isolate Russia. And now the EU is considering gas price caps if the Russian supply is disrupted. Things are going to get a lot worse on the energy front and prices are going to go higher. No doubt about it. Meanwhile, the Fed, the ECB, they both remain way behind the curve. Let's talk about softs because we're seeing lumber higher, OJ higher, cocoa higher, coffee, cotton, sugar, all higher. Significant gains today, led by coffee, scoring over 5% gains today. And then we have metals, and we're seeing a rebound, a small rebound in aluminum and zinc, yet we're seeing more declines in tin and nickel and lead. Meanwhile, gold and silver remain pretty much flattish, waiting and waiting for what? Waiting for the US dollar to make its next move up or down. Of course, if you're a metals investor, you're hoping that the dollar is going to go down. But we're seeing some signs that perhaps the dollar is peaking for now. We'll talk in the charts analysis. Moving on to meats, we're seeing uh, modest gains for feeder and live cattle futures. But here it is, the new big tech, lean hogs, rebounding higher and scoring gains of over 3% today. Now, I'm in lean hogs contracts. I bought some of those today, and I'm still in coffee and rough rice, by the way. But here's the continuous contract of lean hogs. A monthly chart is what we're seeing right now, a formation of a cup and handle. And if it is, then we're going to see higher prices for lean hogs and here is the july contract for lean hogs obviously we have the head and shoulder formation the futures went down big since then but it caught support from about 97 and a half and now we have the resistance at around 108 so we'll take it from there once it gets to 108 what about grains massive gains across the board for the most part led by wheat 
wheat gaining over 6% today. We'll talk in a second. But we have gains for soybeans. Corn, for example, gained over 3.5%. Rough rice gained almost 3% today. Similarly, oats also scoring about 3% gains today. Wheat is going to continue to move higher. We have a massive shortage. The heat wave that we got in India is historic. And of course, it damaged a significant amount of crops. And therefore, India announced over the weekend that they're going to ban exports of wheat. Folks, this situation is getting very, very dangerous. We're going to see a global famine. If India cannot substitute the loss of supplies from Russia and Ukraine, we're going to be in a major, major problem. Look at the output for Indian wheat, for example. It is falling for the first time in six years. So again, when we talk about what will be the country that will substitute the wheat supplies from Ukraine and Russia, it's well, certainly not going to be China. It's not going to be India now. And we have three possibilities now. The U.S., well, we know that U.S. farmers are planting more soybeans, not corn and wheat because the scarcity of fertilizers. Similarly, Canadian farmers, while they might have some access to fertilizers, because Canada happens to be one of the top producers of fertilizers, the ground conditions are not favorable for wheat harvesting now. And who knows when the conditions are going to improve. And then we have Argentina. Well, the weather has been weird in South America, and there is no guarantee that Argentina can ramp up the supply to substitute the Russian, Ukrainian, Indian, American, Canadian outputs. There was just no possible way. So folks, it appears that we're going to go into a famine. Maybe not in this country, but in other poorer countries. And now Nutrin, a company that we talk about a lot in this program, is weighing in increasing potash output. The problem is it is extremely hard to get your hand in these supplies, number one. Number two, the prices continue to move significantly higher by the day. So again, all of these sanctions against Russia are sticking at the boon, brah. Well, they're firing back. and We might suffer a global famine because of that. Again, you can hit Putin, Putin, Russia, all you want, but we got to use rational thinking in how we approach this challenge. We should not be making emotional and impulsive decisions that could cause a global famine. That goes without saying. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, here it is. The volume is down across the board big time. This is not an encouraging sign for the bulls. You got to see call options being bought in this market for any rebound for any bottom to happen we're not seeing this right now if anything the volume is going down this is a bad sign that the retail crowd has lost a lot of money they don't have any more chips to gamble in the casino the volume in apple for example went down big with that being said still apple at number one at around 900,000 contracts traded today for the name around 53 percent of those were calls and at number two tesla the souffle at around 500,000 contracts about 50 percent of those were calls. At number three, AMD, at around 400,000 contracts traded today, about 62% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker NVDA. Notice this, by the way. I haven't seen the casino this dead for a long period of time. Look at the day till expiration for the majority of these trades, for example. Four days till expiration, meaning this Friday. Nobody wants to take risk more than that. So again, we have to take these trades with a grain of salt, but it is also telling that market participants don't have the conviction anymore in the direction of the stock market. Regardless, here it is, the ticker NVDA NVIDIA. They're buying calls, the 185 calls for the expiration date, May 20th, with the expectations that NVDA could move higher by more than 7% by then. They paid around all oh, about one buck and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around five million dollars what about the ticker tsla for tesla they're buying the 800 calls for the expiration date this friday may 20th with expectations that the name could move higher by more than ten and a half percent by then they paid around four and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 13 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker aa alcoa we talked about this name in uh, the last video, but somebody's buying puts here with the expiration date of Friday, May 20th. They bought the 55 puts with expectations that Alcoa could go down by more than 9% by then. They paid around half a buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $900,000. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the ticker PYPL PayPal? They're buying calls this time around, the 82 calls for the expiration date, you guessed it, this Friday, May 20th. With the expectations that the name could rebound higher by more than 5.5% by then, they paid around one buck and 30 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending around one and a half million dollars. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker NFLX Netflix? 
They're buying the dip again. This time around, they're buying the 200 bucks calls for the expiration date. You guessed it again. This Friday, May 20th, with expectations that the name could move higher by more than 7% by then. They paid around one buck and 55 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending around one and a half million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here obviously the weakness in software the high beta names the chips is evident but again when we look at the theme of software chips cyclicals they're down big even though the 10-year yield is trading slightly down this is yet another sign of the lack of conviction we're seeing in these rebounds traders they spot the oversold conditions on the technicals they buy the dip these names blast higher for a day or two scoring 10 20 percent gains in a bear market rally and immediately they get sold off the rallies and the gains become more sustainable in the big pharma names the defensive names with the high dividend in energy and commodities be it agricultural or metals for example the rebounds they stick in these names not in cyclicals and technology furthermore in certain days when we see ultra defensive formations for example buying REITs and utilities that sticks for a little while and then we see massive drops in REITs and utilities because yields on bonds are moving higher so again where do you hide in the stock market where do you stick well, we stick with what's been working. That is big pharma, that is energy, that is defensives, that is fertilizers, for example, that is metals. Not all of them, but some of them. The value stocks, these are the kind of stocks that are working consistently. And this is what you should be looking for for now until things change. Let's talk about specific news for individual companies. We start with Netflix. Netflix told employees, and this is really a change from the narrative that has been going on for a while now. Apparently, Silicon Valley is realizing that there is no money in wokeness. And now in a memo, Netflix told its employees the following. If you'd find it hard to support our content breadth, Netflix may not be the best place for you. In other words, you don't like it here? Take a hike, buddy. We're not going to accommodate your stupid wokeness. There's a limit. There's a little bit of wokeness. That's good. When it gets too much, goodbye. So this is a massive defeat for wokeness, the extreme kind, of course. And then we have McDonald's who is exiting Russia for the first time in 30 years. And again, you know my take. McDonald's is going to write off over $1.5 billion in losses from exiting Russia. And the losses are going to mount because 10% of their revenues come out of Russia. All of these assets will be nationalized for Russian companies, perhaps Chinese companies. And you know my take. My take is our best weapons is not javelins and Patriot missiles. It's actually our culture. Our brands, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Disney, NBA. If you want to have influence in Russia, you got to keep these companies there. The culture becomes westernized. But when you pull out and you leave all of these assets to be nationalized, and worse, be offered for Chinese competitors, and you lose the entirety of the Russian market, what is the wisdom there? What does that achieve? Absolutely nothing. More stupidity from your senile politics and corporate leaders. And speaking of uh, javelins... And money laundering, here it is. Now Lockheed Martin is winning another $309 million contract to supply javelins to the U.S. Army, not Ukraine. Why? Because we gave all of our supply to Ukraine. And now we got nothing. Now we got to replenish our own supplies. You see how this thing goes? Anyhow, we have news from Dutch Bros. This is yet another name that crashed recently. And Dutch Bros says they're confident in opening 130 stores this year. And I say, let me fix this one for you. Here it is. They're confident in opening zero stores this year. And of course, I love Dutch Bros. I lived in Portland, Oregon for a long time when I was a teenager, of course. And I remember uh, this goth girl that I had a crush on. And I would buy her Dutch Bros every single day for almost a year. And I never got lucky until one day I got lucky and I finally got gonorrhea. Anyways, moving on to the heat map for the daily ETFs. We have a mixed picture across the board, mostly muted, but we're seeing losses in technology, in financials, in the cyclicals, the likes of the XLY, for example. But again, the majority of the action is in energy and commodities. XOP, XLE, OIH, even natural gas, UNG, silver, gold, all moving higher today. And of course, when commodities perform, we see the EWZ, the commodities giant, Brazil, moving higher. We also see Canada rebounding the EWC and the Australian ETF, the EWA, also moving higher. The mystery, of course, here. Yes, we have value at performing growth by a tiny bit. Value pretty much barely in the green. But the VIX proxies were down big. Is this a sign that this is indeed a legitimate bottom, at least for now? We should not dismiss it. We should buy the rebound. Let's talk. And for that, let's move on to the charts analysis. We start with the SPY. 
30 minutes chart. What we're looking at right now is we have the support of 398 and then we have resistance at around 405. But most importantly, is what we're seeing right now a formation, a pattern of a reverse head and shoulder? If that is the case, then higher we go. But here are important numbers that you have to keep in mind. 398, if that is violated, then we have the gap at around 392.39. If the chart goes down there, closes the gap, and it doesn't rebound, it actually goes down, then you know the reverse head and shoulder is gone for good. A matter of fact, in all likelihood, we're going to go down to make lower lows. On the other hand, if we have a retest at around 398, let's say, and then we have a rebound higher, and the SPY manages to crack above 405 and secure that as support, then we have more leads, more solid leads, that this reverse head and shoulder formation is going to stick, and we're going to see a rebound rally that could take us all the way to 430. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. Unlike the previous attempt for a rebound that ended up in failure at around, let's say, 4,102, for example, the MACD right now is pretty much at the lowest reading in almost a year. And from that perspective alone, we're getting closer to our bottom. Why? Because how much lower can we go? The weakness is becoming extreme, technically speaking. So the market right now is primed. It has all the conditions for a rebound rally. The selling in the momentum indicators became extreme. The chart is keeping not only 3,850 as support, but also 3,960 as support. And the volume is moving down. Are we getting to selling climax? We've been duped before, and I understand the hesitancy of buying the dip here and betting on a rebound. But again, unlike the last failed attempt of a rebound, this one has better conditions, more fertile ground to produce a rebound rally. Why? Because the selling got even more extreme the last time around. Furthermore, here's the cash index, the SPX from a daily chart perspective. Again, the most important thing for the bulls is 4,000 is kept as support for now. Number one. Number two, the volume is down. The volume is moving down, indicating that we're getting closer to selling climax if we're not already there. Number three, the momentum indicators are bottoming. You cannot get any lower than this. The MACD is at minus 100. The likelihood for a rebound rally at this point is highly likely. And it could take us all the way to 4,200, and then we could see a pullback from that point on. Here's the NASDAQ 30 minutes chart for the Qs. We have a double bottom formation that produced a gap higher. And we're now keeping 297 and a half as support, going back and forth, back and forth, doing what? In essence, the chart is asking any buyers, any buyers. The sellers are probably done. Any buyers, any buyers. If the buyers don't show up soon enough, we're going to take a leg down. But if the buyers do show up, then we're going to go higher, perhaps at 313. But before we do that, we have the battle of the gaps. The gap below at 291.21 and the gap above at 307.41. Which one is going to be closed before the other? And most importantly, how will the chart react after closing one of these gaps? For example, if the chart goes down, closing 291.21, and then it rebounds higher again. That is positive, not negative. But why would you cut 297.5? after retesting that over and over and over again. Now, the other way, if the chart closes 307.41, and then it pulls down dramatically, cutting below 297.5, that is a bearish sign. It means we're going to make lower lows. But if the rebound closes the gap at 307.41, it continues to move higher. That is a solid sign that this is a legitimate rebound a stronger rebound that you can probably bet on. Here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Again, the volume is moving down slightly. That's good for the bulls, indicating perhaps selling climax. The momentum indicators are pretty much at extreme lows. Look at the MACD. We're now at almost minus 400 in the MACD. This is an extreme reading. Yes, it is indicative of the weakness in the NASDAQ. It is a sign of a bear market for sure, but that doesn't mean that we cannot get a rebound and then resume the selling from that point on. For now, the support is kept at 12,207, the resistance at 12,766. If that is beaten, we can go all the way in a retest to the trend line in yellow, which will be at around, let's say, 13,300. Here's the IWM, a 30 minutes chart. Again, we have a gap higher, and the support for now, let's say around 174.22. As a trader, you have two cushions to look at. Number one, 174.22. If the IWM goes down there, watch how it's gonna react. If it rebounds higher, 
after a retest, that's good, that's bullish. But if it doesn't, then you have 172.8. If after closing the gap, the IWM doesn't rebound higher, then run for the hills, we have lower lows to come. But the good news is, even if you're not involved right now in buying the rebound, you got a lot of things for the charts to do to give you comfort. This is a legitimate rebound. If you see a retest at 174.22, and then the chart rebounds, makes higher highs, now you're more confident that perhaps this is a legit rebound unlike the others. And here it is, the daily chart for the Dixie. It all depends on how the Dixie is going to react, by the way. If we have another pop higher, say goodbye, we're going to go down the equities market because commodities are going to suffer, and so will the Nasdaq and the big caps. But if the dollar goes down, cutting 103 as support, that would be an encouraging sign that will push commodities higher, but it will also push equities higher, including the Nasdaq, but I would rather be in commodities than the big tech or the software names. And here it is, gold, a daily chart. It is below the support. It is below the trend line. Not good signs for gold bugs, but if you sat through the sell-off from around 2000, what do you got to lose now? If anything, you might want to buy now. You might want to buy some on the dips, betting that the dollar is going to go down. It's a lot of risk because the dollar has significant tailwinds behind it. But again, we are in the risk business, baby. If you want things for sure, if you want the market to tell you for sure this is going to go up or down, you're in the wrong business. And here's UK oil, Brent. From a four hours perspective, we have the most significant challenge right now at 114, the previous double top. If the chart makes it above 114, in all likelihood, in typical charting behavior, it's going to pull back to retest 114 as support. If that retest is successful, then we will see crude moving significantly higher, perhaps all the way to challenge the highs for Marsh. Here's the daily chart for the 10-year yield again. Is it topping already? Is it about to move down? We have encouraging signs. The momentum indicators are all in negative divergence. We're now dancing at around 3%. The question is, is this the beginning of a head and shoulder formation? If it is, then down we go. This will be good for the NASDAQ, good for the TLT, good for the high beta, high multiple names. Another way to look at it, is this a bear flag pattern? If it is, then down we go. And this will be good for what? The TLT. Here it is. A daily chart this time around. Is what we're seeing right now a bull flag pattern? And if it is, then it should take us all the way to 125.12 and then we'll take it from there. Here's the VIX four hours chart. Again, it lost the support of the trend line. It lost 33 as support. And when we look at the momentum indicators, the MACD, the RSI, both in a free fall indicating that at least the VIX could go down to let's say 26, and then we'll take it from there. And this should be an encouraging sign for the dip buyers and the rebounders that the VIX is moving down. This should be encouraging, but again, after the trauma of being bruised over and over and over again, we can understand the hesitancy of dip buyers to hop in and dip their feet in the water. And here it is, the VXN 4 hours chart again. It topped at around, let's say, 44 and a half, 44 ish, but it continues to be more resilient than the VIX because we're seeing more weakness in the NASDAQ, obviously. It lost 39.99, let's say 40 as support, but the NASDAQ pulls a not out of the woods yet. We got to see the VXM flushing down big, losing 35 for support. We should see the Qs beating the numbers that I just talked about, the gap above, perhaps all the way to 313 for the NASDAQ bulls to be emboldened to buy the dip. The SPY is obviously outperforming because the inclusion of energy and commodities, the defensives, etc., etc. The NASDAQ lacks all of that. And here's the most important name in the NASDAQ, Apple, a daily chart. It continues to keep on the support of 145. The big short is shorting right now. I don't know when he shorted, but we could see a rebound rally that takes us all the way above 150 in a retest to the trend line, which happens to be the lower end of the channel, and then we'll take it from there. The volume is moving down. That's another good sign for Apple. And here's Tesla, the Soufflé and hourly chart. We got a gap higher from 728.10, and today the chart went down, closing the gap and closing below the gap, forming a bear flag pattern. This is not good. Of course, the saga between Elon Musk and Twitter is not helping at all. We're seeing loss of confidence here. We're seeing big shot investors dumping Tesla for now. And the most important line to keep for Tesla bulls is 700. Because if that's broken, the flush down is coming. Which flush down are you talking about, Maverick? Here it is. Let's zoom out to a monthly chart, for example. The MACD is already crossing, creating negative impressions in the histogram for the first time in years. We have negative divergence in the RSI. We have 700 as the last support before we see a massive flush down. Sooner or later, whether we keep the support 700 right now or not, sooner or later, the chart's going to break 700 support. We will see a massive, massive flush down. This stock could
could go down to 100 in a scenario where we have lots of margin calls and a cascading effect of selling. And here's Bitcoin, a daily chart. Again, it is oversold. It is holding at 30,000 of support for now. So do you buy? The answer is, once again, show me the money. The chart has to break above the highs of the previous candle. And if it does, then that's showing you the money number one. Show me the money number two would be breaking above 32,000 and keeping that as support. Then you could buy all the way with a target of 35,000. 750 as your exit point or at least your reassessment point if things remain as risk on overall then why not double down all the way to 40,000 again but if you see a resistance and a pullback and weakness again then you know the deal you take your profits and you move on and we have bad news for tulips because FTX boss Sam Bankman Fried he now believes that Bitcoin has no future as a payment network because it's proof of work system which means it cannot scale up on top of that, we have uh, former uh, printer in chief Ben Bernanke, who says Bitcoin will not be or will not become an alternative form of money. That's the bad news. The good news is you have uh, these uh, twin brothers, the pumpers, the scammers, and they say that Luna sold over 80,000 Bitcoins. That is over $3 billion in notional value. So are we seeing selling climax for now? That depends. Who's going to buy the dip now? The charts are asking. Any buyers, any buyers, the sellers are done, any buyers. If the buyers are still weak and afraid, the sellers are going to show up again. So it's a battlefield for now, but the conclusion is coming soon. And here are some bonus charts for you because we talked about auto parts stocks in the previous video. Here's a weekly chart for the ticker AAP. This is advanced auto parts. I did buy the dip in this one. We have a clear trend line for now, and we have a sloping line of resistance. The breakout is going to happen one way or the other. A break higher means the stock will make higher highs. A break to the downside, that means the stock already topped, and it's going to go down even further. And therefore, I bought via call options. And I did look into O'Reilly and AutoZone, but this is the best value for now. This is the cheapest among the auto parts stock. So we'll see how this works out. But for now, I'm in via call options. And lastly, here's the monthly chart for the Indonesian ETF, the ticker EIDO. We've been eyeing the channel for a long time. If you've been in this ETF early on, well, we've already reached the profit taking target. So for now, if you want to buy the dip in EIDO, you have to wait for a pattern of higher highs. If the chart fails to make higher highs, then down it goes. We're not going to get the break above the channel. If we have higher highs, meaning if EIDO rebounds from this point on, in all likelihood, we're going to see a break above the channel and this will be really, really bullish. So watch out for this chart. It remains one of the top performers among international ETFs. And lastly, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Here it is. We have a lot. We have retail sales. That is the most important one. And then we have industrial production and then we have the home builders index. We also have a lot of fit zombies speaking from James Bullard, from San Luis, and then we have Zombie Harker from Philly, in addition to Loretta Mister from Cleveland and Charles Evans from Chicago. But the top zombie, Jerome Powell, will also be interviewed by the Wall Street Journal. A lot to look at for. Whatever these zombies say is going to move the market one way or the other. So we have to watch out for that. But folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.